Okay, somebody did something. Did you hear that? Okay. Um, I was able to, I believe, unmute the um, the line. This is Marilyn Scholl. Um, Stuart, are you able to speak? I can speak. Can you hear? Yes, I can hear you. I don't know if participants can hear you. Uh, Bill, are you there? I was just speaking to Bill offline, and so I, he may be getting back on, but um, okay. I know He's listening. Sounds good. Eric, how about you? I'm here. Good. Uh, Tammy? I'm here. Okay, good. Well, I am uh, apologize to those of you in the audience. We've had some technical difficulties, but I believe that we have them resolved. And uh, I believe that uh, Bill Gessner will be dialing back in soon. It looks like he's not connected right at the moment. Uh, Stuart, you were you said you were connecting with Bill. I had him on the cell phone to talk about the trying to resolve the technical issues, um, and at that moment you came back on and we hung up. So I don't know where he is exactly. Okie doke. Did we do introductions? We could. <clears throat> yes, let's let's do that. Um, let me uh, put put uh, my screen up here so that we can at least see the beginning of the slideshow. There we go. Um, so welcome to today's webinar. I uh, apologize for our delay in getting started here, but I believe that we are making progress. Uh, today's seminar is Planning Your Member Loan Campaign and will be presented by Bill Gessner. The webinar is being sponsored by Food Co-op 500, Cooperative Development Services, and CDS Consulting Co-op. Stuart Reed is here from uh, CDS, uh, sorry, from Food Co-op 500. And uh, Stuart, I wonder if you would say a few words about Food Co-op 500. I'd be happy to. Uh, Food Co-op 500 is sponsored by organizations like the CDS Consulting Co-op, NCGA, and the National Co-op Bank in an effort to help support uh, the startup efforts of groups like yourselves all around the country. We have had contact with nearly 100 such organizing groups, so you're not alone. And today is one of many efforts that we are making to try to help make your path a little easier. So please let us know if there's other things we can do. And if you haven't already been in touch with me, I encourage you to, to uh, send an email or, or contact so that we can get you on our mailing list and keep you up to date. Thank you so much. And uh, Marilyn, while I have a chance, I'd also remind you that uh, at some point, start the recorder. You know, I had started the recording quite some time ago, so we're getting more than we asked for here today. Um, All right. Thank you, Stuart. Um, the, um, my name is Marilyn Scholl, and I'm with CDS Consulting Co-op. And we are a group of 16 consultants specializing in food cooperatives. And in the last uh, five to six years, we've been um, developing services for uh, co-ops that are just getting started. And this webinar series is a part of our effort in uh, helping you with the tools that you need to be successful. Um, next, I would like to introduce uh, Bill Gessner, who is our presenter today. Bill? Hello, Marilyn. Hello. <laughs> can you hear me? I can. Good. Excellent. So um, you could turn the presentation over to me if you would like. I certainly will. There you go, Bill. OK, you can see my screen? Yes, I can. Now we'll go to the slideshow here. Bill, I have not yet uh, explained to people how to ask questions. So um, let me do that, actually, before you start. On your toolbar, on the right side of your screen, there is a tab labeled Questions. If you click on that, it will open up a space for a question. And then uh, when we get those questions, Stuart will field the questions. And uh, when uh, Bill takes a break or asks for a question, Stuart will, will um, read, read your question. And uh, we would like to invite 
someone to uh, type in a question or a comment now just so that we can be certain that we're hearing you. So experiment with that and send us a message. Thanks very much. And now, Bill, back to you. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, welcome, everybody, and thank you for being with us today. We apologize for the delay here in getting started. I think we're set to go. And we have an ex what I think is an exciting topic today, um, uh, planning a member loan campaign for your food co-op. Uh, we're primarily focused on uh, startup food co-ops in this case. Um, I would assume that a number of you um, listening and attending here today have been, have participated in, have attended previous webinars. And, but if you haven't, uh, welcome and we're glad to have you. And if you haven't attended before, we're glad to have you back. Um, we have uh, an agenda today um, that I am showing here on the screen. Um, the, the primary focus is around planning the member loan campaign, and we're going to kind of walk through the different bullet points under that item number two um, and uh, spend about uh, probably a half an hour or so in that area. And uh, then we'll talk a little bit about the implementation of a member loan campaign to see how that relates to the planning of the member loan campaign. And uh, then we'll have some time for questions and discussion. Uh, even as we're going along here, I'm, I will encourage Stuart to um, interrupt me from time to time if there is uh, a relevant question related to what we're discussing at the time. And I'll try to pause um, uh, occasionally also for questions. There's a lot of material here to cover. Uh, the, 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 the slides uh, will be available on the um, website uh, by the end of the day tomorrow. I don't think they're available today. Uh, but they will be available for downloading, and there will be an audio uh, download available from the webinar as well. Um, the goals for for this webinar are to, I'm looking at them as three large goals, uh, learning goals, to gain an overview of what is involved in planning and implementing a member loan program, uh, gain a greater understanding of how to organize a member loan program, and to understand the role of how professional consulting, support, and legal counsel can uh, help and assist you in the planning and implementing of a member loan program. Um, we are fortunate to have with us uh, three, four, or five guest participants today, um, people who have um, been through and, and worked with uh, member loans in food co-ops, uh, both existing food co-ops and startup food co-ops. Eric Paul is the general manager of the Troy Community Food Co-op in Troy, New York, a co-op that is, is in the startup phase. They're hoping to open their store sometime in um, 2009. Uh, Eric, uh, would you like to say hello? Hi, everyone. Nice to be here today. And uh, thank you. And Sharon Rud Rudnitsky from the uh, River Valley Market in Northampton, Massachusetts. Sharon is on the board of directors there and was uh, intimately involved with their member loan campaign. And Sharon, are you with us? She might be muted, but I think she is here. And um, Tammy Bowers uh, is also with us today. Tammy has worked with the Seward Co-op in Minneapolis and Mississippi Market in St. Paul, uh, helping them playing a major role in their member loan programs. Uh, Tammy, are you here? Yes, I am. Thanks for inviting me, Bill. Great. I and, just heard uh, an un unmute message. This is Sharon. Hi, Sharon. Hi. OK, I'm here now. <laughs> and uh, Ron and Barrett Griffith from Just Food Co-op in Northfield, Minnesota. I think they're at least attending. I don't know if they are in the panelist uh, segment of the audience or not, uh, but Ron and Barrett have, uh, did, were instrumental in the member loan campaign for Just Food Co-op that opened um, is it three years ago now in Northfield, Minnesota. In 2004. We're here. Oh, wonderful. Great. Hello, Ron and Barrett. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, Ron just said it opened in 2004. Okay. Thank you. So uh, we, we want to be able to 
um, draw on your experiences and your expertise of the of our guest participants here as we go along. So I don't want to be doing all the talking, but I, I want to kind of lay the groundwork here a little bit to begin with. So uh, you all hopefully are aware of the development model that is uh, part of the Food Co-op 500 program, four cornerstones in three stages. Uh, very simply illustrated here, the, the four cornerstones of vision, talent, capital, and systems are important components of your of your co-op from the very startup process through the sustaining growth and um, success of your of your co-op uh, once you get a store open. Um, those cornerstones are surrounded in, in this drawing by the three stages, stage one, stage two, and stage three. Stage one being organizing, stage two, feasibility and planning, stage three, implementation. So we try to work with this model and learn from this model as we're continuing our work, uh, you know, collaborating with many of you and working with you to start up your food co-op. Um, again, the three stages, you've seen these slides here. I'm going to just go quickly through them, uh, an overview of the three stages. The dotted line after stage 2B shows where a site has been secured with contingencies. And then going into stage 3A, the design work and the pre-construction planning and getting all your financing in place. The solid line after 3A is where the contingencies are removed. That's your final decision point. No turning back once you cross over and go into stage 3B. Uh, another way to look at this, showing the approximate time range for the different stages. Pay attention to stage 2B as we're going through this. And um, also the stages from a point of view of assuming a store of 6,000 square feet uh, and that you would probably want to have 1,000 members at least by opening, perhaps even more, but showing how those different member threshold steps uh, correspond to the different stages. Again, stage 2B, by the time you secure a site, um, you know, recommended that you probably have 600 members. Um, and looking again at these stages, seeing some of the key decision points related to each of the stages. Again, these slides were available in previous webinars, um, but, so I don't I don't want to go uh, too much more in depth with that. But to say that during stage 2B is when the planning and preparing for a member loan campaign happens, and that in stage 3A, that is typically when the member loan drive is launched. Once you have secured a site with, a, with contingencies, uh, either a lease agreement or a purchase agreement contingent upon getting all your financing in place, then you can go public with your, with your site and then you have done all the planning work for your member loan drive, and then you will launch that. At least that's the typical standard pattern. We'll talk about a few exceptions to that. So that's putting the, the member loan program in the context of the three stages. Um, why member loans? Um, it's important to have a base understanding here that, that member loans are a very significant way to raise member capital and that members have a responsibility to help capitalize the co-op. Um, so the member equity, <clears throat> the member equity share, the membership share that people pay to become a member is, is probably the base capital, but then it really takes a long time to really mature your membership and in some ways, the member loans function, you can think of them functioning as a bridge uh, over a 10-year period of time to when your member equity base will be fully, fully built uh, by your community and that you need to have some of your members coming forth to willingly help support the co-op through making loans um, 
and that those loans are, are in effect, a bridge uh, as your member equity is more fully developed. The member loans will help leverage bank financing uh, because they are unsecured and subordinate to the primary bank debt. The primary bank debt will have the first position and the member loans will be subordinate to that and they will be unsecured. Thus, member loans you know, are a risk and the members who choose to make a member loan have to be comfortable taking that risk. Um, members who are willing to take the risk uh, by lending money to the club demonstrate their commitment. So it's a way to build and demonstrate commitment to the co-op's mission or it's the ends that it is working towards. Uh, I view member loans as a, as a healthy test. Um, it's a test of the membership and the community's commitment to having a viable and sustaining food co-op. Uh, member loans are serious, uh, <laughs> serious matters and they, they, they instill a level of, they begin to instill a level of accountability in the organization, in the co-op. If you're going to be borrowing, it's one thing to have your members invest an equity share of $200 and that's sizable enough and there's responsibility enough tied to that. But when you begin to raise sizable amounts of capital from your members, uh, there is a, there's an accountability that comes into play that is very important. Um, member loans, when do they happen? Uh, typically you want to be able to move through the early stages of your project without having to rely on member loans. Um, there, uh, as we illustrated earlier, that the member loans are typically planned during stage 2B and they are implemented during stage 3A, the pre-construction time. Uh, and typically you would want, before you launch a full member loan drive, you would want to have at least 400 members, you know, maybe as many as 600 members before launching your member loan campaign. There are some situations where a member loan campaign uh, can be launched in phases even before getting to stage 3A. Uh, I specify a couple of them here. Uh, member loans, number one, member loans are needed to fund portions of the organizing stage and or the feasibility planning stage. I, I know of a few startup co-ops who have raised a, you know, a small amount of money relatively, let's say 20000 or $30,000 from some loans from from members who are very committed to the to the project and very willing and understanding that their money may be is very strongly at risk, but that, that those initial loans they're almost kind of done informally, um, and and they're uh, but they can help fund the very early stages of the project, which comes first, the cart or the horse, to help you get through that dilemma. Uh, secondly. Uh, a member loan campaign can launch bef can be launched before a site is secured as a way to help uh, get a head start on your financing to begin give you greater confidence that you can you know kind of test the commitment level of your members and help build momentum and if, even if members initially say no they're not interested in doing this you go through a process and you begin to educate your members about the responsibility of capitalizing the co-op so if you're, particularly if you're stuck or if you're facing some very complex um, site securing, site selection procedures, you might want to launch a member loan drive before you've secured a site. And in that way, um, you get members investing in your project um, in a way that is not tied to a specific site location. And I, I think that can be very healthy. Uh, you know, the board is, is, is elected to be making the decision about site and, and, and location. Um, and the, you want your members to show their support of, you know, of the board of the co-op. And so that's all a very healthy dynamic. Um, it, uh, generally, this, this last item here, when, when um, it's, it's best that if member loans are raised, that for the most part, when you do a full-scale member loan drive, that you pledge to not use the member loan proceeds 
until you have all your financing in place, until you're reaching and if that final decision point and ready to cross over into what is called stage 3B in the three stages timeline. So that you can, when you're doing your full scale member loan drive, you can say to your members and pledge to them that we will not, we will not take your money and use it if we're not assured that we're going to be able to go forward and open a store. Now that's the exception to that is, is that number one up above there where I talk about in the very early stages if you need to raise $20,000 to help you through the initial organizing stage, that, that would be an exception to that. So, so that's just a little bit of the, of the, of the basics. Um, to, to kind of summarize broadly, planning a member loan campaign uh, will usually take at least four to six weeks of steady focus and progress. And implementing a member loan campaign, if it is very well planned and organized, the member loan goal can be reached, in my, my belief. Uh, you can get your commitments to reach your goal within a four-week period once you have launched. Uh, but in your back pocket, you should, uh, without telling anybody, you should allow for a two-week overrun allowance. So, Essentially, it could be a six-week, four to six-week period of implementation, four to six weeks to plan and four to six weeks to implement. Uh, the goal is to collect the member loan commitments as soon as possible after you receive the commitment, at least within 30 days of the commitment, and assume that perhaps 10% of your commitments will wither away before they are they are collected. So the importance of collecting them promptly is important. So I'm going to pause for a moment and um, and uh, ask a couple things from our panelists here. Uh, Eric um, uh, from the Troy Food Co-op in Troy, New York. Uh, this is a startup co-op that is in the midst of uh, a member loan campaign, and you've been at it for a while, and there have probably been a couple different phases of it, but I think your most serious phase started um, this you know, this fall. Uh, but Eric, can you just give us a little bit of update about what, what your co-op is doing with your member loan drive? Sure. Um, be happy to. We started the campaign um, after, you know, sort of, you know, with a letter and followed by phone calls around the second week in October. And, uh, and our sort of wrapping up what we consider the first time through the membership in the next, um, we'll be wrapping that up in the next few weeks. And we have raised um, 54 loans totaling 148500 with an average loan of $2,750, from a, which is from about nine, just over 9% of our membership, 9.1%. Um, our goal right now is 290,000, so we're about halfway there, and it's on a total project budget of 2.25 million. Good. So I think it's very interesting what your co-op is doing, and in, in that there, your timing is probably <laughs> not of your choice, but that you essentially launched your your member loan drive at a time of you know with the economy going in the tank, and and uh, and. You know the this ideal that I speak of in terms of being able to reach your goal within a four to six week period. Uh, you know it sounds like you're have run the drive through maybe a, a three month period and are getting about halfway there. And so I think that's a it's an interesting uh, scenario or picture to look at. I think you should be really uh, pleased with the progress that you've made that you have been able to raise. You know almost 150 thousand uh, dollars you know at a, at a very challenging time uh, in terms of the market uh, the, the economy uh, how did how have um, your members um, talked about the economy as you as you've approached them um, the members I, I haven't been the one doing all the phone calls but the reports that I'm getting from our callers are that 
um, people are cons are concerned about the economy and the risk involved with the loans. Um, at the same time, there's the sort of support for the program and for the co-op has been, we feel, has been very strong with where we are. And um, members have said to us that it's not a good time and their portfolios are either in a wreck or in a place of uncertainty. Um, and, but it's important to them to do a loan, that the project is that important to them. Um, overall, they also, some have asked for, you know, have certainly said, you know, we're not really sure what our financial, financial situation is. So we're not going to say no, but we do need a little more time to determine that. And so we've okay. stacked them on a list of, you know, where we'll call them towards the end of the, camp the campaign. And um, overall, our plan is to um, make it through this first time through, do a real strong push to double our membership, and then to go back again. And uh, after significantly increasing the membership, and ask again for loans. Yeah. Eric, uh, can I, uh, how, how big is your current membership? There's a, one of the uh, participants was asking. It's uh, 591 members right now. Thanks. Okay, good. Uh, I think that's a good strategy, Eric. And, and uh, you know, as you go back to your members and update them of your progress, I think you can have some positive messages to uh, send to them in terms of what you have been able to do at a, at a difficult time. Uh, I think if I look back at, you know, the history of, of cooperatives uh, and even what I, my own experience of food co-ops over the last 30 years when in, 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 in recessions or difficult economic downturn times, I think the food, food co-ops have generally done well. And I've seen a number of cases where member loan drives have been able to be successful. Um, and it's where members are choosing to make a, a social investment and what they might even consider a safer investment in, in something that aligns with their values. And uh, so I think there is a real opportunity to do this if you if you present yourself properly. Uh, realistically, though, I think you do need to acknowledge that yeah, these are this is a challenging economic time to do this. And uh, you know the fact that you've taken three months to get half to your to half your goal is is a reality that might need to be looked at and acknowledged. Uh, at the same time, I would say that I, I know some of your planning process and how hard you and others worked on it, but I would say you could look back at that and say perhaps there are ways you could have been better organized and more timely and, and tried to get momentum working stronger in your favor. And um, that's, not to be, that's not to be judgmental or critical, but it's just, you know, it's an observation. And I think it applies to, you know, most of the projects, uh, the food co-ops, and so again, to stress the importance of the planning period, uh, you know, how well can you get yourself planned, how well can you plan your member loan drive and get yourself organized so that you can be prepared to launch at the appropriate time. So, um, Would this be a, a, an option time to ask Eric a couple follow-up questions about their specific program? Yes. Um, how long did it take you to get up to your 591 members, Eric? Uh, we incorporated uh, in, I believe, October 15th of 2006, and uh, we'd had we'd done, I believe, for about a year organized, you know, with community meetings and things like that. Um, so. Really, since October 2006, we've been growing our member equity. What, what's your minimum loan amount? It's a thousand dollars. Our our loans range from a thousand. Our loans that we've received to date have ranged from a thousand dollars to twenty-five thousand dollars. We're still looking for that fifty thousand dollar loan. We, we got a compliment for you on your website and a question about whether you post or would consider posting membership and loan results there. 
Uh, yes, we're in the process of um, sort of working on a communications plan now that's taking a look at the website and the ways we can better use it. Um, I mean, thank you for the compliment. I'm a little embarrassed about some of the some of what is out of date on it, but um, that's a continuing websites are continuing process uh, process and tool for communication. So we're we're looking at that. We'll be probably posting um, at least our uh, growing membership on there and um, possibly the loans if that's not in the secure member section it, it may be on the it may be on an open part of the website we're not sure yet but uh, there's a couple of questions but they're actually uh, applicable in general terms and I know Bill's going to touch on them later so for those of you who have other questions um, they'll come later probably thank you Thank you. Um, so moving along here, what is in the planning phase of a member loan program, one of the most important things is 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 the setting of a goal, um, and to get clear and specific on what your goal is. And in order to do that, you need to have worked through probably a couple of versions of the sources and uses budget. Uh, something that we've uh, featured on previous webinars, and that also you need to work through a very a complete financial performa that shows financial feasibility for your proposed project and shows um, the ability to service the debt, both your primary bank debt and your member loan debt. Uh, and what, so once you do that, you can begin to get focused on an appropriate goal, uh, and when you're my recommendation in terms of setting a goal is not to say, oh, we want to raise as much as we can or we want to raise between two hundred and five hundred thousand dollars and well, if that's what it ends up being, you'll you might raise two hundred thousand dollars. So be specific about what your needs are and have it be an achievable goal, um, but be be serious about it. Um, typically the the owner's contribution in a sources budget, uh, sources and uses budget should be as close to or even in excess of 50% of the total project. Um, Eric uh, talked about their project being a $2.5 million project, um, and so half of that, the owner's contribution, might be as much as uh, a million and a quarter uh, that needs to come primarily from either member equity, member loans, or donations, or fundraisers, or grants. Uh, the member loan portion of that owner's contribution is typically 75 to 80 percent of the owner's contribution. Um, we're seeing startup food co-ops uh, are raising between $300,000 and a million dollars, uh, with average size loans ranging from three to five thousand uh, dollars. Existing food co-ops are also raising amounts. There, uh, some now are have raised. A million and a half dollars, you know, for for member loan or member capital programs. Uh, in an example that we could look at here, um, uh, a six thousand square foot store, uh, the development cost, the source and uses budget per square foot. Let's say it works out to two hundred fifty dollars per square foot, uh, and that um, that uh, that. 50% of that needs to come from the owner's contribution, and then 80% of that, 50%, will be member loans. So that would say suggest a total of $600,000 in member loans. Um, the average size loan, once you kind of analyze and assess your demographics, and the, that you might set a goal for an average size loan of $4,000, uh, that would take 150 loans. Uh, do that. So that's just a quick, uh, a quick sketch of setting a goal. Um, basic terms for member loans and food co-ops. Uh, I've worked with quite a number of uh, projects, existing co-ops, and some startups as well, um, and have worked with well over 100 plus member loan programs over the years. Typically, the terms are. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten years. In other words, um, the loans will will come due 
Some of the loans will come due in four years, some in five years, some in six years, et cetera. And you kind of balance it out so it's not all coming in one year, but a, a balanced amount. There's usually no payment of principal in years one, two, and three uh, after the store is open. Uh, typically also no payment of in interest. Usually interest is accrued and paid back at the end of the term. The minimum size loan level should be set. Uh, at least $1,000, such as was done with the co-op in Troy. Uh, and there may be some situations where it might be higher, but then you begin to exclude some people from the ability to participate in the member loan program. But if you, for example, set the minimum at $500, it'll make it much harder for you to reach your goal. Uh, we're seeing some co-ops set a minimum of $2,000. Uh, I've seen some set a, you know, existing co-ops set a minimum of five dollars or $10,000. Um, interest rates are set up typically as simple interest rates, annual interest uh, typically set at a not to exceed level of kind of assess the market at the time, but in today's market it might be 3% and members choose their interest rate not to exceed the maximum rate. Uh, rather than setting a bunch of steps or scales, if you invest this much for this long you get this interest rate, keep it simple. Uh, set a ceiling amount. Uh, but you could create a second category and for loans that are, um, let's say, $10,000 or $20,000 or more, maximum interest rate can be set at a higher level, uh, let's say 4.5% in today's market to help incentivize those larger loans and help to get that $50,000 loan that the Troy Food Club is looking for. But I wouldn't recommend any more than two categories. Uh, otherwise, it gets so complex and people look at it and they try to assess which one they're going to go for and they look at it and they look at it and they eventually go back to watching television. The, um, uh, do not set the interest rates too high to attract speculative investors. I think that's general wisdom when it comes to um, having a member loan program that is well well planned and is based on some solid concepts. If you're trying to attract quick money with high interest rates, you're likely to attract people that could be, in a worst case scenario, if it happens to get to that, that can be, that can be very difficult for you to deal with. Um, member loans, again, the part of the basic terms, member loans are unsecured and subordinate to the primary bank debt. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that some of that language, but it's, it's, it basically means that there are no assets. Uh, the members making a member loan don't have a security position in any of the co-op's assets, and that the primary bank debt is, comes first in terms of how the debt is, is serviced. Um, So targeting sources um, you've, is part of, you know, you've set a goal, you've set some basic terms. Um, generally what I've found in food co-ops, including startups, uh, is that you need at least four good targets for every loan. And for startups, five would even be better, I think. Uh, Eric's mentioned that 9% of his, their members have made a loan. so. Um, if all their members were targeted in one out of four, that would be 25% of their members making a loan. Uh, 100 loans, uh, in other words, then with one out of four need 400 targets. 150 loans, they need 600 targets. So you're planning of what you think that average loan size will be and how many loans you're going to need. That's all part of the planning process. Uh, included within these targets, of 400 or 600 targets would be a subset. We'll begin calling this the large loan category. Uh, for every large loan greater than whatever level you set that at, whether it be 10 or 15 or 20,000, um, you need two targets. So, so if you're going to try to um, raise $600,000, let's initially project that at least 200,000 of that will have to come from large loans. That would mean 
10 loans at an average size of $20,000 would require your 20 very best targets for individualized, customized appeal, uh, whatever is the best way to approach that particular person. Uh, so you kind of take them out of the out of the, the mass approach that you're doing with the rest of your members. Um, an exercise that you can do in planning your member loan drive is to create a pyramid sorts that would show how many, you know, to reach your goal of, let's say, 600000 how many $1,000 loans will there need to be, how many 3000 5000 10000 20 50 or whatever category. Uh, sketch that out and take a look at it and see if it looks reasonable. And then as you begin to implement, you know, work off of that, monitor and modify it as you need to. A basic strategy that has been utilized with food co-ops, what I found most effective, has been to do a mailing, to mail an appeal letter to a target list that we've talked about. And the, the appeal letter is basically a one-page letter, very well-crafted letter uh, that has a call to action and that will promise a phone call within seven to ten days. Um, for startups, usually the, the membership roster is the target list. Uh, then you follow up the mailing with a phone call. The goal of the phone call or phone calls is to seek a verbal commitment from the member. Um, and this approach, you, you can also, in your mailing, you can encourage members to, if they want to contact you, initiate contact with you, or uh, that they can call so-and-so or email so-and-so. So you will, rather than wait for a phone call, that's a good stuff to do. But um, it's, it's, I think, a better approach rather than trying to call, let's say, a community meeting or have a fundraising meeting to try to raise member loans or to have a series of house parties to raise member loans. Generally, and this is a little bit in contrast to some segments of the nonprofit sector where socializing is part of the fundraising, um, I think it's more on a one-on-one -on -one basis that these commitments are gained in, in the food co-op sector. Uh, a special strategy is needed for large loans, uh, and we talked a little bit about that. It could involve meeting with the targeted member, um, and again, a customized approach, figuring out the best way to approach each of these lo large loan targets is the way to go. So. Getting organized is a big part of, of planning uh, a member loan campaign. And one approach to it is to begin to try to pull together a task force or a committee that might eventually, not necessarily the first meeting, but might eventually get to be seven to ten members who are actively willing to work on this project. Uh, you, as soon as possible, you need to, in my view, identify there are three primary roles that need to be clearly filled, uh, ideally with one person. Uh, there's a little bit of an exception to that with, when it comes to the caller, but we'll, let's think of it as one person here, but that there's a coordinator, a caller, and a collector. And that if those roles are blurred, it bogs down, in my experience, it bogs down the whole implementation effort as well as the planning effort. And so to try to focus on what those, learn about what those roles are and who you can get as the best for each of those. Uh, that's three people, but there will be plenty of work for others on the task force to support and assist, assist the coordinator, the caller, and the collector. The coordinator, a basic description of their responsibility is that they coordinate and organize the planning and implementing of the member loan campaign. They're responsible for coordinating the large loan drive aspect of it, determining the best approach for each of those targets. Uh, they're responsible for daily monitoring, communicating, and delegating. The caller 
Um, well, you might have more than one caller. Try not to have too many callers. Uh, the reason I say that is a lot of times I've seen where uh, a co-op has said, well, we don't have anybody who wants to do the calling. We're going to split it up amongst all of us on the board. And, um, and it ends up that all the loans come from one section of the alphabet because one person is really good at doing this. And so that's my intent in trying to help you uh, filter and find your best caller or callers, one, two, or maybe three callers. Now, there have been groups that have done more, but um, had more callers. But I believe if you can have narrowed down to your very best, that is, to me, the most effective approach. The caller uh, needs to like to ask people for money. Not many people do. Uh, they have to be good at asking people for money and they have to be able to instill credibility, either have it or quickly instill credibility uh, when they're talking on the phone. And the goal of the caller is to get a verbal commitment. And uh, the caller is not necessarily, but maybe, but not necessarily involved in the large loan drive. That's, a, that's a something that is coordinated and driven by the coordinator of the member loan campaign. Once a verbal commitment has been gained by the caller, I suggest that one person be designated as the collector. Um, and so a verbal commitment could be, yes, I'd like to make a loan to the co-op, or even more detailed, yes, I'd like to make a loan of $5,000 for six years at 2%. Anyway, that information and all information that the caller has about the person is turned over to the collector, who will then finalize arrangements and paperwork and collect the loan, either in person or by mail. This function requires very careful and consistent collection uh, and attention to detail. And so if you have a lot of people doing this, the danger of people ending up, for the co-op ending up being disorganized with all its records and people being told different stories and having different types of a closing experience uh, is something that you want to stay away from. So again, try to have one person be your collector. Usually groups resist uh, the breakdown of these three roles, and they want to say, well, I'll do a little of this, and I'll do a little of that, and I'll do a little of this, and I'll do a little of that, and we'll have co-chairs, and we'll have five of us doing this. And, and things tend to break down uh, for the most part in those situations. Getting organized um, involves a lot here, and I'm just going to run through these very quickly. Um, organizing the task force, seeking appropriate professional consultation, planning and preparing written documents, organizing your target list, your database, and the mailings, planning for newsletter, website, or group email, communications to members, seeking appropriate legal counsel to review all documents, creating a budget for the member loan campaign, uh, and getting early commitments during the planning phase. So those are the primary things that make up the planning of a member loan program. The written documents I listed at least seven of them here that you will typically need to develop, including an appeal letter, a member loan brochure. I often refer to it as kind of just a simple hand holder that says, oh, there's a member loan program here. And while they're reading the appeal letter, they hold the brochure. It gives them a little bit more information about the program. And then there's a member loan information packet, or sometimes called a disclosure document or prospectus. Uh, this is not, the member loan information packet is not an appeal. It is a disclosure of risks, full information that if once people start expressing interest in making a loan, then you get them this information. It is not mailed out initially to everybody. Then there's the promissory note and other legal documents. Good to gather testimonials from people who are planning to, who have committed to making a member loan. Why are they doing this? And you can design a nice little sheet to include in your mailing. 
uh, other promotional materials, visuals of the store, newsletter articles, presentation type things for community, different parts of the community, etc. cetera. Uh, and then a log sheet is needed for each target to record results. Uh, and then there's planning the mailing, you know, getting your envelopes. This is something I always emphasize is that they need to be hand addressed uh, with legible handwriting with an attractive stamp. They're more likely to be opened and be opened in the right uh, receptiveness spirit than a coming with a mailing label. Uh, they'll need to probably organize a mailing party that'll be a fun and festive occasion. And then training needs to be done, developing a script, frequently asked questions, talking points, role playing, and building energy, commitment, and fun is, again, part of the organizing. So that's a, a quick run through of what is involved. There are a couple other items that I want to talk about, but I want to take a little break here. And I want to perhaps um, ask Tammy, uh, Tammy Bowers uh, to speak just a little bit about uh, her experience in helping. She's worked, I guess, with existing co-ops, but uh, a lot of applies to the, the same process that startups go through. Um, you know, what are what were some of the key things for working with Seward Co-op and Mississippi Market that helped make their in in the planning of their drives that helped make the loan drives successful? Can you comment a little, Tammy? Sure. Um, I mean, I guess, like you said, we were fortunate enough to have um, no existing co-ops seeking out money. Um, so there was staff people to, to help. But um, working with a marketing person um, and the general manager, um, just working on how to disseminate information. Um, and everything that you've listed here were all things uh, that we had, had done. Uh, you know, working hard at crafting a letter that we hoped would um, catch people and get people to, to think about it, um, creating a brochure and a prospectus um, that we felt was very professional looking um, and you know, had information and was friendly, but was also professional working for people who were going to bring their member loan information packets, say, to their financial advisor. Um, Stuart Co-op was very, very diligent in that process in particular. Um, Again, promissory notes and other legal documents, which I wasn't involved in, but those, but the lawyers and the general manager. Um, testimonials is nice. It's something that um, neither co-op used per se, um, but they did. Um, I was thinking about what Eric had said earlier, you know, about whether they'd go public on their website with uh, their member loan total. Both co-ops were pretty um, active in publishing their loan totals, um, and Seward was particularly active in getting permissions to list people's names, um, for example, in their co-op newsletter or whatever, saying that they had uh, invested. They didn't say how much or anything like that. They didn't go into any details about that, but did, did allow their names to be used as sort of um, a testimonial. Um, we did lots of signage in the stores, because we had a store to put signage in. But um, can, you imagine, can you imagine how to uh, do the planning and preparation you know, for a startup co-op and how they, you know, what what type of things might be most important for them? I think electronic. I mean, if, you know, for the people who have it, and it seems like, you know, a lot of people do, um, co-op shoppers tend to be somewhat plugged in, I think, electronically speaking. But um, it's such a great tool. It's such an easy way to keep people in the loop um, other, than, other than hard mailings. It's free, for one. Your website's a great one. So if people have heard just only your name, perhaps, or that you're trying to start a co-op, if they if they Google it or do whatever, that they come up with a website that has some of this information and that does have information about um, that they're looking for you know, members and member investors. Um, it's somewhat of a tricky area, from what I understand, just because you're not supposed to advertise, so to speak, a member loan. I don't know, Bill, if it's your experience has been about that. Um, yeah, you, you, we, we, you, can't be, you can't be advertising to the general public. Right. Uh, listening to the general public for member loans. Right. So we were just always very careful about any time we were saying that we were doing that, how we worded that. Yeah. Um, but but it seems like... Um, and how, how much 
How much did you, have you with Seward Co-op, how much was raised uh, in terms of member capital for their project? For their project, which is, um, mind you, a very expensive project because they went for lead certification, there was a lot of other aspects that made it an expensive project. They, they raised $1.5 million yeah. from a membership base of about, I mean, it started, when the process started, they were probably at about 3,800 members. They're currently now probably over 5,000. Okay. Um, and those are active members? Would those be are active members, yeah. correct. And um, Mississippi Market, who's a two-store system, they there had a smaller goal of 350,000, um, and they were able to reach that. Uh, and just recently, just as you were talking about the kind of the financial situation for a lot of people, Mississippi Market started theirs um, in the, the summer, and so right away <laughs> we sort of got hit with a lull, um, sort of dealing with pre-election and, and the economic situation, there was uh, definitely a slow point there. So I, I, I empathize with Eric and, and other co-ops who are trying to start up. Um, but just, it's a great investment. I'm, uh, we always were <laughs> very, uh, very encouraging in talking about, um, you know, you have the ability to see the financial records. It's something that's in your community. It's something that you have an effect on people, um, on the, on the health of the business by shopping there, by telling other people to shop there, by encouraging others to invest, by encouraging others to become a member. It's, it's such an active investment that I always found it very easy to talk about, and people were always very excited about it. So. The, and the, then, the uh, email communications, the, I, I found that with group, starting a group email, even with just a very small number of inter people who are interested in the member loan drive, and to be able to then give send out at least, let's say, twice weekly updates on the progress, uh, especially once you've launched the member loan drive, uh, and then getting more and more people who, who want to receive those you know, twice weekly updates right. is, is a great way to, to build momentum. It was, and it still is. I mean, it, and people were really enthusiastic about it. I mean, um, I always got and when the steward, when I would send them with from my personal email, I'd always get people, you know, re replying back to me, you know, and, and having questions. And it was just such a great communication tool in general, other than just keeping people updated on what's going on, but just allowing them to respond back. Yep. So if there's, you know, if someone's just actively monitoring, if you're allowing for replies to come back and not blocking that, and then making sure that someone's actively monitoring, it's a, it's a great tool for you to keep building um, the excitement and make sure that your relationship is good with your membership or anyone else um, in the community. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it really is a great tool. And if you do it from the beginning, you'll continue to build your list. And I just think that's a, that's a really great tool, right. especially for startups. Well, thank you, Tammy. Um, I want to move along here just a little bit to a topic that everyone will wish that I won't talk about. Uh, <laughs> And that is uh, the importance of early commitments. And this is always a, a difficult thing to talk about as I work with different boards and um, uh, steering committees, et cetera, of, of co-ops. But it's very important in the planning phase uh, to get some initial commitments from the leadership of the co-op. And I say that you need to raise, um, during the planning phase, at least between 10 and 15 percent of the total goal for your project so that when you go out the gate, when you launch your drive, you already have some momentum, you're already partway to your goal. And rather than starting out, you know, day one at zero. Uh, typically in the nonprofit sector, a lot of the strategies are to start out with 50% going out of the gate uh, in, in terms of donation drives. This is different. Uh, again, these are loans, but even so in, in the co-op sector, we're not expecting you know, the board would be coming up with 50%, and they were people were never recruited to be on the board or in the leadership of the co-op on their basis to be able to do that. But uh, I do think it is important that together, collectively, the the board be putting in 10 to 15% of the total. If from the board itself they're not able to do that, you can expand that. You might call it an inner circle, uh, but as you to include some other people that are consider, let's say, leaders of the co-op. Uh, but as you do that, the more you expand it, the more you need to go from 
let's say if you had 8% from the board, you did, but you weren't in the 10 to 15% category, once you start expanding that inner circle, then you need to get up to 15% in terms of these early commitments because you're starting to tap into you know, other parts of the, of your, of the, of the well of, of support that you have. Um, and as I talk about this, I found over the years that, that I can't emphasize enough uh, and repeat that, that not all board members or leaders of the co-op are expected or required to make a member loan. Uh, if a person chooses not to do this or is not able to make a member loan, that person should be respected for their choice. Uh, they should not be made to feel bad. They should not lose sleep or consider resigning from the board. And I've seen too many good board members uh, take on feeling bad about this and even you know, saying, well, I, I can't make a loan. I guess I'm going to resign. And that's not the, the purpose at all. But the, the board as a whole does need to wrestle with this dilemma. And uh, I've, I've worked with many boards and helped them wrestle with it. And they all find a way out of it. Um, the, 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 the intent here is that the board as a whole needs to demonstrate their willingness to put a significant amount of personal money at risk. Um, and, and this can be a talking point as you're going out to talk with the membership, being able to say, yeah, the board is not just volunteer their time uh, here, but they are putting their money at risk, you know, as a show of, of support of the direction they're endorsing. Uh, and I found that typically for both existing food co-ops and startup food co-ops, that, that a co-op is able to raise about 10 times um, what the board or the leadership group commits to lending. So if your board says, Collectively together, we can come up with $2,000, uh, and that's it. Then I would, my first projection would be that you would, as a co-op, be able to raise about $20,000 from your members. So this is a, a test and an indicator, uh, and it's a very important part of the planning phase of a member loan drive. And lastly, uh, the legal console. Uh, is extremely important during the planning and implementation phase of a member loan drive. Uh, there are federal and state securities regulations that need to be complied with. Uh, exemptions are possible in some cases, but you cannot ignore the reality of securities regulations here when you're planning a member loan drive. Uh, it can be a challenge to find a qualified attorney who specializes in both securities law and cooperative law. Uh, be prepared for working through a number of hurdles and, and barriers uh, as you go, as you begin working with an attorney. Uh, and you know, I'd be glad to talk with any of you who are in, trying to do that and are in search of an attorney or trying to find an attorney or find how to best work with them. Uh, typically, member loans can only be offered to members of the cooperative and that members who are residents of the state in which the co-op is located. Um, and solicitation of non-members is not allowed. So an important part of your planning process and even part of your budget for your member loan drive is to be looking at legal counsel. So um, I want to uh, call on Sharon. Yeah. Um, who's uh, Sh uh, Sharon Rydnitsky, who is on the board of directors of River Valley Market in Northampton, Massachusetts, uh, one of the startup co-ops that opened, I believe it was in, in, in early, or May, was it May of uh, 2008? Mm -hmm. after, yep. after decades of um, preparation. One decade. <laughs> decade of uh, One decade. <laughs> Sharon, can you tell us just a little bit about the total member loans that were raised and how many members and, and any words of wisdom you have in a, in a minute or two here? <laughs> okay, sure. Um, we raised $1.1 uh, $1 million from uh, 233 individual loans. Um, and we did also raise, uh, we had 14 institutional loans, so other co-ops. Um, and our local bank gave a loan. 
so we, that was one strategy we also used. We went to other co-ops who were really generous, and um, so so of so it was about 13 percent of our membership. We had a total of 1,800 members at this time of our campaign, um, giving loans, and they ranged um, from $1,000 up to $50,000. We had 84 people giving a $1,000 loan, so a lot of people really gave you know, the low end of the loan. And then we did have, you know, 38 people giving $5,000 loans. We had 16 $10,000 loans. And then um, a couple 50000 a 30000 a couple 25000 So we were able to target some people who could give more. Um, let's see. As, as to, you know, words of wisdom, um, one uh, – when we, when I, I made a lot of the calls, I was the coordinator and a caller, and as a caller, I found you know most people were saying no. You know, 13% of our membership was able to give loans, but that means you know you know 87% were not. So when I received a no, I really made them feel. Uh, I really was grateful to them. Like, thank you so much for joining and doing what you can do. We realized that you know level of giving is not for everybody. And we did offer people an opportunity to increase their equity. That was another way we brought in some money um, to, you know, we encouraged them they could put that in their equity account and that would be there in the future if they ever wanted a refund. Um, so that was just another way people could contribute. Um, and then another thing that worked really well for us was at the end of the campaign when we were at like 900 something thousand dollars and we wanted to get over the hump was we had a huge party. It happened to be in early December. And so we we got together with all of the people who had already given loans and other people who had been on the fence about loans. And we rented out a space that supported local restaurants. And we had some speakers. And um, there was just a lot of enthusiasm in the room. We all shared the vision. And you know we asked people to bring their checkbooks. And we raised uh, the rest of the money at, in that evening. So that was really successful and fun. You, you closed the gap in a sense that way. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So, um, and, and you're, uh, in, in, in many ways, I would say your project would not be a model project in terms of the, the length of time it, it, you know, your whole project took. <laughs> uh, right. You know, yet your accomplishment has, has been great, and, and I think your community is very excited and proud of what has, has been created there, and it's a beautiful uh, co-op and store. Uh, the time it took to raise the 1.1 million, um, not in terms of how many hours of your time, but uh, how over what period of time Yeah, was we started that? planning probably January, February, March, you know, we're having meetings, and then we maybe asked for our first loans from the board and from the Inner Circle maybe in April. And then this party was in December, and we were still doing collections in January and probably February. Uh -huh. So, you know, a good nine months. Yeah. Six, you know, nine months. Yeah. Well, that's, that's good. I mean, for to raise that amount in, in that period of time. And uh, I, think it, I think there was, I don't know that you had your site even finalized at that time, did you? Uh, we did. Okay. Um, yeah, we did. Yeah. So, anyway, very good. Yeah. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Um, well, we've got uh, quite a backlog of questions. I don't know um, what you have planned here for the rest of the time, but if you'd like to get a few in. Yes, yeah, so let's take a few, Stuart. Um, how about a budget for the campaign? How much? How do you calculate what it's going to cost you to do a campaign? Mm -hmm. Well, you need to just look at all the different items in terms of uh, mailings, postage, uh, printing, um, you know, what are the legal costs uh, likely to be, uh, what type of consulting support do you need, um, you know, are you, you know, sometimes there's a, uh, you know, that you get in, into a, a real dilemma in terms of, you know, it's, it's a lot of work for the people who are doing this, and most of the people are doing it on volunteer work, but is there some type of stipend involved for the callers? Um, in most cases, and mostly with startup co-ops, no, there isn't, and it, it is a volunteer uh, situation. Um, but it's, 
it would it would not be unusual to have a, a budget of ten thousand dollars or more, uh, ten to fifteen thousand dollars to put a, put together a well a very strong member loan campaign. What about the option of using preferred shares in lieu of a loan campaign, uh, raising you know a significant amount of money through the sale of preferred shares? Um, and hopefully, we, we, if this is going off track too far, we, we can maybe skim over it. But we want to talk to that, to that one a little? Yeah, it's, it's a very big question. And, and uh, you know, it, it, in some states, uh, you might run into problems with member loans, and you would then need to go to a, a preferred share or investor share type of program. Um, some co-ops have structured uh, these are, I guess, primarily existing co-ops have structured both a member loan program and a preferred share program and tried to incentivize both of them appropriately. It gets very challenging to do that. In some ways, my view has been that member loans are most straightforward and most easy to understand and really are give the best protection to the member. Uh, preferred shares gives the advantage to the co-op. And um, yes, it would be nice if, it, if these were all could be done as preferred shares. But many co-ops have talked about doing this, and some have had success with it. But I'd say a very small percentage have had the ability to walk their talk with prefer, preferred share program. But I think that may be changing. Um, you know, and so as you're doing the financial planning and planning all of your financing out, it's certainly worth taking a look at. And you know, I'd be glad to talk with groups and work with you on that. But it's too deep, too complex to go into in any depth here. Um, well, um, I've got a question that I think I could answer, but I'll let you do it. Can members put loan in their IRA or 401k, or can they use make an IRA donation? I think we're getting at the, the, same, the issue of uh, tax liability and the fact that co-ops aren't charities. Right. So you want to answer that, Stuart? <laughs> well, yeah, OK. Generally speaking, retail food co-ops cannot be considered a charitable organization, in fact, almost never. You may be able to form an education, an educational division of your co-op that's separate, a legal entity that could potentially qualify. But a retail food sales operation is not a charitable organization, whether you're called a nonprofit in your state uh, statutes or not. So it would not be possible for people to make tax-deductible donations. It would not be possible to invest in the co-op as if it were a, a um, kind of a long-term investment like an IRA. Very good. I'm uh, showing here in these last few minutes here the two slides that I haven't had a chance to talk through. And so I'll keep going back and forth between them as we answer another question or two. All right. Um, why would you recommend not using a professional fundraiser? Well. Uh, the, the, the point I make there is that if you hire a, a professional fundraiser to go out and raise the money for you and to be front and center and visible and to be making direct contacts with your, with your members, it will fall flat, in my uh, opinion. Uh, a professional fundraiser can help you with the planning and with the strategy, certainly. And, uh, you know, they will bring... Uh, an approach that is probably different from what has been used in co-ops. And there are a lot of good ideas to look at and consider. But I find um, that it's, it would be the approach that is being suggested here, I think, has been workable in many, for many co-ops. And to, to work with your, if you're using a professional fundraiser other than, than myself or CDS, that you know also you know, share with them this information or have them talk with us. And, you know, I've at times worked with people local in their communities who are professional fundraisers to help them work with the local group. Uh, so that can be an attack. But the point I make is not to turn it all over, wash your hands of it, and say, oh, we're, we hired a professional fundraising firm to raise our member loans. 
um, some of the participants who have worked with uh, you over time have uh, got a comment that uh, the number that you recommend of members before you start working on a member loan program has risen considerably over time. Yeah. Um, is that just a matter of the economy, or, or is there some other reasoning behind that? Well, I think as we're, we're learning more, uh, you know, from experience, uh, a, a lot of times I was work, I encountered some groups, uh, you know, four or five years ago that where their goal was to get 100 members, and uh, it took a lot of work to stretch them to get to 300. And <laughs> uh, you know, not, and I thought that was that's that's 10 times better than 100 uh, members. And you know, as it's turning out, you know, you know, 500 is really not enough when you look at you know average. If let's say members purchase 50 percent of your the co-op sales, the average member buys so much per week, and you kind of figure it all out. You know, you you need somewhere between, you know, 800 to 1,000 members, I believe, for a total store size of 6,000 square feet. Um, and the more, the merrier. If, if Bill, you've referred to 6,000 square feet. You're referring to gross square footage there, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. So I oftentimes use the example of 4,000 4,000 retail thousand total. Uh, certainly there can be more, there can be less. I would like to invite uh, Ron and Barrett Griffith to comment a little bit about, I've worked a lot with Ron and Barrett are uh, in Northfield, Minnesota and did a lot of work with Just Food Co-op uh, and is, is founding members and founding leaders of that co-op and I've learned greatly from them over the years and been inspired by their work. Um, and they, um, I am working with them on a member loan toolbox that that uh, is taking me much longer to do my work than I hoped it would, but uh, hopefully we'll get that out. But as a collaborative project between the three of us. But uh, Ron and Barrett, do you have a couple of minutes to um, share a few things with us? Yeah, this is Ron. I, Bill, I can affirm everything you've said. And, and admit that it took us a bit longer than the time frame you set. We kind of used what you showed on one slide, but I don't think spoke about, which is we worked a while, then took a break, and then worked a while again. We kind of broke it into phases. And that's probably in part because we started with only 300 members when we launched our, our member loan campaign. And as you recall, we had to increase our sources and uses budget during the member loan campaign, so we had to increase the target. So we used that strategy very effectively that kept it from being a marathon. It made it kind of into two dashes instead of one marathon. The other thing I'd say is something you emphasized when you trained us is how much energy we would get from this. And I don't think I've heard you mention that today. The callers just got a huge amount of positive feedback from the interaction with people. And that coupled with Barrett's coordination of holding uh, caller meetings just kept the um, the energy level and the and the stick to itiveness of the callers up, which was I think totally critical. This is not something to try to do just kind of by yourself. You and your phone, you can't make all those phone calls. You got to do it with people around you. Great. And uh, Barrett, are you there? Do you have some comments? Well, I th for us, I think one of the key things was the capacity that we had to do a lot of the electronic. Um, and we communicated, or I communicated, I gathered all the information together and communicated at least twice a week where we were, what we needed to do, and kept really working. Everything was done electronically, so I sent out um, reports to each of the callers every week on, on where they were based on the information they gave me, and then I shared that with the whole team. So we were able to track progress in very small increments so that we kept feeling like we were getting more, getting more, getting more. Great. And yeah. then we, well, we met. I mean, our team met um, every week, almost every week over supper. Uh, somebody would put on a pot of soup and everybody would bring something and we'd report and see what was going well, what wasn't working, where we could help each other out, who needed help, um, who had uh, could take on a few more calls because they were done with theirs. And that I, that, I think, created a container of momentum that was just, Invaluable. And that was in 2004 when you raised how much? Well, 
One thing that, that you're smarter at now, at least than we were then, was we didn't segregate our loans. So we just had one category of loans. So we had a couple of large loans that we've not been able to call member loans because we negotiated a separate rate for them. If they were, however, loans from members that came as a direct result of that, if I count, if I count that, it was right around 350, if I recall correctly. Yeah, um, and that was at a time when, you know, I, I would say where your bank financing probably came in as a higher percentage of the project than it would be today. And so did. that's yeah. a point that, you know, today, given the economic conditions, the member loan percentage of the project needs to be probably higher than what it was four years ago. Right. I, I look at the numbers you use now, and I'm glad we did this in 2004 rather than today. It's a, t it's a much tougher situation now, and I, yeah. I really respect the people yeah. who are undertaking this now. Yeah. yeah. And it was really important for everybody sitting around the table working on this to make a loan. I think I do think we I do think everybody did, and I but we really made a, a point too that you didn't need to make a loan. Right. But the energy of that had it be that people did make loans. Yeah, we raised forty five thousand from our core team, uh, which was obviously uh, fifteen percent of the initial three hundred thousand that we were looking at. Right. Well, thank you very much, and I like that you that you reminded me of the of the whole energy component here because the. The energy and enthusiasm and excitement and the momentum that comes from this really brings uh, life into your project. And uh, it can be a high-spirited time. It, it's very hard work uh, through this. Uh, you know, you begin to look at how many hours a week it takes for the primary people to be doing this. And to work in the spurts of, of four to six weeks um, is, is probably the way to go if you try to sustain it intensely longer than that, it, it's, it's too much. Um, I still believe that, uh, you know, if you were perfectly organized, you could raise the money in, uh, in four weeks. But uh, we're not all perfect. But it's something to, to aim for. Um, and we're coming to the close here. And I really thank one of, um, Eric and Amy and Sharon and Ron and Barrett for being with us today. And we could have turn the whole time over to them, I'm sure. Um, I did want to try to provide some basic information here. Uh, going back to our three learning goals, the goal is to give you an overview of what is involved in planning and implementing a member loan program uh, to gain a greater understanding of how to organize it, and the role of professional consulting, support, and legal counsel. Um, certainly, the member loan drive needs to be driven by the local co-op, uh, but it's something that in most cases you haven't had the experience of doing before, and there are ways to bring in the best practices that co-ops have found successful and to have some support of what you're trying to do. So I would encourage you and would welcome having you know at least initial phone conversations with all of you or any of you who are interested in, in this topic as a follow-up to this webinar. Uh, my contact information here is... Um, at this last slide and our celebration slide. And um, Stuart and Marilyn, I'm going to turn it back over to you. All right, Bill. Thank you very much. That was very, very informative. I wanted to remind folks that we have three more webinars in this series. The next one will be uh, one week from today, Marketing and Promotion with Kelly Smith of NCGA. Uh, after that will be uh, Hiring Your First General Manager with Carolee Coulter, and then Project Management with Denise Chevalier. Those will be January 14, January 21, and January 28.